Hello and, and welcome to today's show. I'm your host, David Winstead, and on this program, we want to provide viewers information about topics of interest to municipalities in our community. Our program today, we're going to talk about an issue that everybody is very concerned about, transportation and pedestrian safety. And to help us in today's discussion, I'll be talking to Wes Guckert, who's president of the Traffic Group. And I had the pleasure of working with Wes a number of years ago when uh, we were both working with the Transit Task Force here in Montgomery County under Ike Leggett. But Wes, welcome and thank you for being here with us. Thank you, David. My pleasure, for yeah. sure. And tell us a little bit about yourself and sure. background. Uh, we are a firm of traffic engineers and transportation planners. We have a national footprint and we do work for uh, federal government agencies around the country. Uh, we do work for, mail, uh, for departments of transportation on a national basis. And locally, we, uh, we do quite a bit of work for, uh, for the development industry, for builders and property owners uh, throughout uh, Maryland and, uh, and beyond. Well, that's great. So, Wes, one, you know, I know we're just coming out of COVID here and that um, one of the interesting things during 2020 is that we really had a huge cut in mobility. We saw about 14 percent decrease in terms of vehicles traveled on our road systems here in Montgomery County and, uh, and around the country. And yet at the same time, we saw a 24 percent increase in fatalities, pedestrian fatalities. And can you can you give us a little bit of why that happened and what's going on? Yeah, I, I think there are there are a couple different reasons for that. Number one, it's important to realize that not only uh, did did uh, uh, vehicle travel, vehicle miles travel go down, um, which they are now coming back. But what happened was as the as the number of vehicles were reduced on the street system, it encouraged just it encouraged people to drive faster. Oh. And so mm -hmm. what has happened is as the capacity increased because there were fewer cars, uh, drivers took it upon themselves to drive faster. Okay. And so we, we faced a really, almost an epidemic of speeding. Uh, police were not stopping them, and people were, were driving just as fast as they felt comfortable driving. And yet, we still had bicyclists and pedestrians uh, were, were really in the way right. and, and uh, getting hurt more and more and more. And the you know, over 2020, people, you know, we've seen this huge increase in telecommunities. So people are at home, right? And they were going out and walking in their communities more than maybe they usually do. So that exactly. probably exacerbated the issue. Yeah. And, and what, it, what, uh, what is starting to happen now, David, is that um, individuals are still shying away from buses and rail transit. And, they're, and that's, that's, therefore, more vehicles are coming back on the road or more people are walking or more people are biking. And so you've got this confluence of fewer transit riders, more bikers, more walkers, more cars. And we're, we, we really are in a very dangerous situation uh, in Montgomery County, and quite frankly, on a national basis. Interesting. So li looking at Channel 16, the Montgomery Municipal Channel and the constituency of our 19 municipalities and, and residents. What is it given this growth in pedestrian accidents and more people walking because they're working from home and stuff? What, what are some of the things, I know Montgomery County over the years has been very sophisticated in planning, one of the most you know, sophisticated counties in the country in terms of planning for growth and accommodating adequate public facilities, but what can municipalities do more uh, you know, with a situation where you've got, you know, less cars and more accidents. Um, let me start, go back about 10, 15 years uh, when the European Union uh, faced the same problem. And they designed a program called Vision Zero with the goal of getting to zero pedestrian and bicycle fatalities in their country, uh, and it was really Sweden that really started it. And quite frankly, um, and, and I will talk about two different size countries, obviously, right. but, but Sweden got to, to zero pedestrian fatalities 
as I recall, last year. Wow. Um, Montgomery County uh, and and the county executive have have done a, a really uh, admirable job of moving Montgomery County towards a Vision Zero program. Mm -hmm. uh, not only have they laid it out, but they have an annual work plan and it's funded. Mm -hmm. that's, pro that's the most important thing, that, they're, that they have funded their Vision Zero plan. And what that means, to answer your, your question about the municipalities, is that they themselves, if they are concerned about bicycle and pedestrian accidents and fatalities, need to start looking at and mirroring what Montgomery County has done and come up with their own mm. Vision Zero plan. It takes planning. Right. It takes, it takes money. It takes desire. And it takes stakeholders. And it takes champions that really want to see that something like this happen. Right. Interesting. So uh, you have this constant balance, don't you, between uh, people's need to commute, and uh, granted, you know, I think the long-term impact of COVID is many, many more people are going to telecommute in the future. But the whole issue of getting to a job and being able to do it safely has to be balanced by sort of traffic calming and road design elements and tools, right? That's always the debate, the, the demand in terms of number of vehicles needing to get somewhere, and how do you design the roads to make them safer, but still allow for efficient commuting. Well, uh, th there's a conflict between those two things, David. Mm -hmm. And and the fact is, there's something called Complete Streets, which is a Complete Streets program is geared towards getting to Vision Zero. And Complete Streets will take uh, and do a whole bunch of things. Uh, it may narrow the lanes. It may reduce the lanes. It will maybe uh, increase sidewalk widths. It will build cycle tracks. Um, it may remove parking. It may add parking. So there's a there's a whole uh, a, a whole landscape of things that can be done in complete streets to get towards a a Vision Zero plan. But the most important thing that you have to do, because you mentioned the word traffic calming, is to slow the cars down. Right. And there, there are cities all over the country, quite frankly, all over the world, that are adopting uh, a, a universal speeds that are 20 or 25 miles an hour. Hmm. Uh, and indeed, what that does is it slows the cars down. It helps deal with some of the Vision Zero issues. And, right. and uh, I'll talk about the, the fact of, of what speed does right. in just a minute. But... Uh, it does conflict with movement and speed and congestion because as you slow the cars down, you're, you're going, they're going to be going slower. You're going to reduce the capacity of the roadway right. and you're going to increase congestion. So on one hand, you're liable to have constituents say, I can't get to work in time or I have to got to leave more time because there's congestion. On the other hand, you've got constituents who are walking and biking uh, and taking their kids to school who says, you got to slow these cars down. Yeah. Somebody's going to get killed. I can't get to work on time. Somebody's right. going to get killed. Right. I can't get to work on time. Right. Somebody's going to get killed. Right. And so you're going to have that conflict, and there needs to be uh, a little bit of a balancing act. And someone, uh, an elected official, has got to say, well, I want to move the traffic to make these people happy. Another elected official is going to say, I, I don't care about slow traffic. What right. I care about is one life or one child or one bicyclist or one pedestrian getting hurt right. or killed uh, or, or injured. Right. Wes, uh, we first met decades ago when I had the pleasure of serving as Maryland uh, Secretary of Transportation under Governor Glenn Denning. And I remember this issue of traffic calming. I remember there was a huge debate at State Highway about the efficiency. And back then, it was a, it was a European idea of, of roundabouts. Yes. And that the idea was you, can, you don't have the traffic lights at intersection. You have a continual flow, but tr drivers need to be disciplined in terms of how you enter and what the, you know, what the yields and right-of-way are. So 
that appears to be playing a bigger role sort of in both allowing for mobility in our municipal communities and countywide, but also doing it more safely. Is that, is that fair? There seems yeah, to be. Yeah, a let me let, let's talk about roundabouts for a, a, mm -hmm. for a moment, because there are uh, over 70 roundabouts now in the state of Maryland. And what roundabouts do are a number of things. Number one, uh, they eliminate the uh, the T-bone uh, most dangerous type of accident because your accidents that occur within a roundabout uh, occur at a very slight angle, not a 90 degree angle, right. a very slight angle. They might be, they, and they're going to end up being generally fender benders because cars are entering and going through a roundabout at 10 or 15 miles an hour. They're not, they're not yeah. approaching uh, or running a red light at 40 or 50 miles an hour right. uh, on an arterial road. So what happens is that from a safety point of view, roundabouts are far safer than a signalized intersection. Mm -hmm. Take it one step further, signalized intersection, when you get to a stoplight, your car is stopped and idling. That creates more uh, pollution. You never really spend any time stopping in a roundabout. Right. So it becomes more efficient from a not only capacity point of view, but an environmental point of view. Right. So there, there are uh, half a dozen reasons why roundabouts yeah. are a great solution uh, when you've got a four-way stop or a signalized intersection. Got it. Great safety solution and environmental uh, quality. So just on that point, you, you feel we got 78 in Maryland, but there could be a much larger universe of roundabouts. Right? Absolutely. Of course, it's a question of taking property, right? It's well, a question of how do you construct something like this? You need more uh, easements. You need more to acquire more uh, land around the intersection. Well, right? if, you're doing, if you're doing a roundabout on a major road, the answer is yes. If you're doing a roundabout in a municipality, there are things called mini roundabouts. Okay. Okay. And if you, and they're, and they're being built all over the country and in Europe. I was I was in Ireland and they had a roundabout uh, that the inner circumference was a big truck tire. That's it. Huh. So you you do not need to have hmm. or take property right. or or take great great swaths of land right. Right. to build a mini roundabout and solve. Uh, some of the problems uh, that exist at four-way intersections. Right. And you feel that that here in Montgomery County and the municipalities, which are some of them are, are small, some of them are larger, uh, that there's really, there's no difference. You can pull it off there and create greater flows, you know, slower speeds, hopefully not impact mobility, but have a safer tool there, safer yeah. result. Yeah, the, the answer is absolutely yes. Right. You can you you can create better mobility. You can create safer situations, right. without a doubt. Right. Well, uh, Wes, we're going to take a, a quick break. Already? Uh, yeah, already. But we're gonna we're gonna come back and talk a little bit more about what technology is providing in terms of controlling traffic and and both and pedestrian safety, lights, and that kind of thing. And also, I think it would be helpful to to hear a little bit about how some of the traffic calming technology that you have uh, suggested or that you're aware of impacts on mobility and then what's needed on our major road systems like I-270. So when we will take a break now, we'll be back in a few minutes.
Honey, what I think you need is a socket wrench. I played JV basketball. I'm sorry. I don't think it looks right. This is good, and it's all is good, it, baby. Is it really all good? If you love me enough to routinely test your handyman skills, not to mention the strength of your marriage, then of course you'll visit nhtsa.gov slash the right seat to make sure I'm in the right car seat. I'm going to call my dad. Well, welcome back. Uh, I'm David Winstead. I'm hosting this discussion with Wes Guckert of the Traffic Group. And Wes, we were talking, you talked about the, the net zero uh, objectives of, of the county executive about safety and pedestrian safety. But, you know, a, a large part of this is sort of the new technology that's available, correct, in terms of signaling, in terms of road sensors, in terms of pedestrian crossing you know, better lighting and better sensors about pedestrian crossing. And it'd be interesting, I, I noted that there was a lawsuit uh, in, in, in the city of Chicago, which the Justice Department is participating in about accessibility and safety of pedestrians, somebody that got hurt that sued. And so how does all the new technology play in and hopefully benefit this issue of demand for mobility and pedestrian safety? Well, you know, pedestrian safety is also part of Vision Zero um, and a big, big part of Vision Zero. And what, what the municipalities need to do, what Montgomery County has done, is that they have gone and they've, they have uh, looked at, made a comprehensive review of uh, pedestrian crossings and, and what meets ADA and what doesn't meet ADA. In fact, as I've been doing work for the Veterans Administration uh, on their hospital campuses, they've got a big problem, not following the manual uniform traffic control devices, not following uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm. And so uh, what's happening in Chicago is that you've got uh, pedestrian crossings that have not uh, that, 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 that are not handicap accessible, oh. that do not have ramp, proper ramps, that do not have what we call uh, detectable um, uh, plates where someone that in a, either in a wheelchair or with a cane that has, uh, has vision problems is able to know that they're coming up on an intersection. Technology is now also playing a big part in that because as a result of COVID, uh, they, you, they are, there's now an opportunity to put in pedestrian push buttons that you do not need to touch. Oh, it's simply proximity okay. where someone can place their hand near the button and it will activate, uh, it will activate the pedestrian crossing signal. And it's one of the reasons why you'll see that uh, there was a point in time when you would have uh, multiple push buttons and multiple pedestrian crossing has on the same pole. The problem was that someone that was either sight challenged or hearing challenged right. would not know which uh, signal they were getting to cross north-south or to cross east-west. So as a result, um, uh, as, a, as a transportation industry, we've separated the poles. They've got to be at least 10 feet apart okay. so that if you're crossing north-south, that that pole is right. That pole and push button is right there. So when it sends you an audible signal, you can hear it, and it will not be confused with the one crossing east-west. That's that's ten feet away. Uh, so that's that's one le level yeah. of technology that is extremely important uh, for pedestrian activity. Uh, on the other hand, we've got something called a hawk. H a w k. Uh, pedestrian crossing. And when you and I were growing up in this industry, uh, to suggest a mid-block pedestrian crossing right. was heresy. Right. It would, was never, ever going to be approved by the Departments of Transportation. Right. Well, they got smart. They figured right. out that a pedestrian, a child, a handicapped individual is not going to walk uh, a thousand feet in order to get to the next pedestrian, to the next right. signalized crossing, right. Right. if if you want to get from point A to point B, and there's a there's a, a playground on one side and a school on the other side, and they're mid block, right. they're they're going to want to cross. So 
uh, from a technology point of view, we now have a circumstance where a pedestrian can walk up to a, a crossing, uh, much like they do with vehicles. Right. The, the pedestrian uh, will be noticed uh, electronically, right. either by, uh, by a radar or proximity sensor on the ground, that will then say, okay, there's a pedestrian <clears throat> waiting, waiting to cross, right. and they'll, they will shut down the traffic. Well, you know, Wes, traffic. we had, you know, I uh, serve on the board of managers of Chevy Chase Village, yes. which is one of our 19 municipalities here in Montgomery County. And we had huge concerns because we have a wonderful community and a great uh, staff of public works and, and people. But we were bordered by Connecticut Avenue in Wisconsin. You know, we have 40,000 cars a day coming down Connecticut Avenue. So we pushed for one of these Hawk crossings right by the city hall. Right. And State Highway approved it right. very recently. So it, it is coming. And I know the, the benefits of that. Um, let me ask. So... What is demand for mobility and safer streets and better signaling for pedestrians is all a part of it. But how does an elected official sort of balance this issue of people getting increasingly frustrated by being in congestion? So the the more volume you get, you know, the quicker people can get there with with this issue of of, you know, really trying to reduce pedestrian safety. I think it's it's a constant balancing act, isn't it? I mean, you need to ensure that people can get to work and get the kids to school, but aren't facing uh, backed up congestion at every turn, right? And so how do you balance those two? It, one thing is mobility and one thing is safety. And I know, you know, I know a part of this, you've talked about better street design, right? And more mm -hmm. sensitive, complete streets where you've mm -hmm. got pedestrian, you've got bike lane, you've got volume lane. But how do you... How do you basically balance that approach with the need to get people to, to where they need to go? Well, I think, I think an elected official has, uh, much like they do on, on other topics, they need to take a stand. Uh, they, they need to uh, do the very best they can to have complete streets in order to reduce uh, pedestrian bicycle accidents as much as they can. Let me give you, an, let me give you a statistic that is frightening. And that is, first, uh, there have been more SUVs and pickup trucks sold over the last five years than, than any other type of vehicle. Mm. Right. M meaning. You, you see it on the roads. Meaning <laughs> people have stopped buying uh, the way they used to sedans. Right. And as a result, uh, SUVs and pickup trucks have a higher impact point on a pedestrian. An S a, a sedan will hit you in your, your knees, in your knee area, a SUV or a pickup truck is going to hit you in your torso. Right. And because of that, because of that, at 20 miles an hour, you've probably got a 90% a, a chance of surviving being hit by a vehicle at 20 miles an hour. Right. When you raise that to 40 miles an hour, it's just the opposite. Right. Um, you've probably got an 85 to 90 percent chance of dying right. at 40 miles an hour. Right. That's why I talked about the fact that that getting the speed limits down to 20 to 25 miles an hour is very, very important. Right. If if the elected official and and all elected officials are going to be concerned about both those things, pedestrians and bicycle uh, and deaths versus capacity and mobility. Um, I think a, a wise and a, uh, a good elected official is going to choose, uh, I'll put up with more congestion right. uh, if I can save, save a life. Yeah. And that's what's going to happen. And what will happen is, uh, I think ultimately, you're going to, as things get more congested, right. you're going to push uh, cars off of the more local streets, off of the arterials, onto the, the freeways and the interstates. So that takes us to the next question. Uh, you know, as you manage our communities, municipality, our communities with safer streets and better design, more complete streets, you do have mobility demands, as you suggest, that drive you to the larger highway system. Yes. So what is your thought about, you know, the fact uh, Governor Hogan advanced a P3 project called Traffic Relief Plan. Mm -hmm. And it uh, there have been a lot of 
participation by statewide on this plan, but it was awarded uh, about two months ago to a company that uh, has done a lot of work in Virginia, actually, on yes. the HOV lanes. So how, how do we tie that together? So the proposal is to add additional HOV lanes, right, to also incorporate transit. I mean, you did a study yes. for the county on BRT. The reality is BRT could use those HOV lanes, right? Correct. That are coming. So Free. Free. So how does, what, what part of this whole picture does, is that traffic relief plan of the states? Well, I think it ties together because uh, if we end up with more uh, congestion on collector roads, it'll push that vehicles to arterials. Now, we got to make sure, we got to make sure that the arterials are properly designed with pedestrian crossings, safe pedestrian crossings, hawk signals where needed, uh, the new technology, um, because those, those corridors will also start to get congested and will, it will move people to the freeways and arterials. That is where uh, we were not dealing with pedestrians and bicycles. Right, right, okay? right. And so right. what we want to do is to create the capacity that is needed because folks are going to move off of the collector and arterial streets right. because they are going to be a little more congested. And let's get them to the streets that are safely capable right. of handling increased traffic volumes. Interesting. So it really is a, a partnering between these two developments. It, and, and it hasn't been talked about. Uh, yeah, that way. It hasn't been talked about that way, yeah, but, but, very but I've given it a lot of thought and that's very exactly what's going to happen. Very interesting. So let me ask you this question. So uh, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, we've all used Uber now. I mean, uh -huh. people are going to their smartphones and, and, and doing ride sharing and, and uh, uh, using Ubers to get to where they used to perhaps drive. And so that reality and the fact that they're not going away. I mean, they're huge companies now with a lot of resources to get better technology and to make that that rideshare service more available. So as that continues to grow, I know we certainly during COVID, we saw a huge reduction in vehicle demand and mobility. People were working from home, but what role does that play in this whole picture of you know, mobility and safer reality for pedestrians and people on, on the sidewalks? I think it plays a huge role. Let me, let me give you a couple examples. Uh, the mobility as a service systems, Uber and Lyft and others, um, they're called Mobility as a Service, M-A-A-S. They play a huge role because uh, we've all seen buses at midnight with one or two passengers. That's a waste of resources. And so what is happening is Uber and Lyft are partnering with transit agencies to provide the oh. needed service uh, for, for individuals that are working uh, late at night, early in the morning, where it no longer makes sense for, uh, to run a, a bus, as an example. Right. That's one thing. Second thing is that we're all familiar with the slug lines that are, are down on 95. Uh, we did a big study for the Pentagon uh, helping manage their slug lines. Uh, there are individuals that are no longer want to get into a car with multiple other people that they don't yeah, know. Yeah. And so Uber and Lyft is going to also uh, be a, a, a service, a technology service that uh, can take the place of some of those individuals who are no longer want to want to be part of a slug line. Interesting. Interesting. So it will expand and and. Uh, so, uh, Wes, I really appreciate your participating with us. I mean, your understanding of, of traffic and safety. And, you know, your one comment about cars is we're not going to turn that around, right? Right. You're not going to convince people to buy uh, less SUVs. That seems to have been taken, taken off. But uh, they're really so sort of looking ahead. We're hopeful that even Biden's bill will provide more money for road safety, correct? Yeah, and I, I think it will. Um, and and what what I recommend for the municipalities is that they contact the department, the Maryland Department of Transportation. Uh, they contact uh, 
the, the county executive, but mostly I think the money is going to come from the Maryland Department of Transportation because it will be it will be getting money from the federal government. Got it. So these types of things that we've been talking about, the the complete streets studies, right. uh, the uh, funding of complete streets, the lowering of the speed limits so that we can get to Vision Zero, so that uh, we are saving lives is wildly, wildly important to me. Um, I'll give you one final example. The Washington, D.C. Has a, has a Vision Zero program unfunded. Oh, okay. And that's where, yeah. that, that's where uh, the county executive here, County Executive Elrich, has done the right thing by not only building the plan, designing the plan, uh, he has funded the plan. Right. And well, that's then, so important. Well, Wes, thank you very much for joining us. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, wealth of knowledge, and I think our, our viewers and, and the municipal officials will really appreciate the time you've taken. Thanks thank you. for being here. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Anytime. Well, again, thank you, Wes. And also for the viewers, thank you for joining us. I hope you found this very useful and informative for the municipal officials in Montgomery County, as well as obviously the citizens and everybody that enjoys our communities. In closing, David Winstead, my pleasure to be with you. I'm hoping next month to have the Maryland Transportation Secretary, Greg Slater, in a, in a program of this nature. But thanks again.